Nightcast at 11. WTVN-TV Channel 6, Columbus. Now for a treat. Something we like to do at 2020 is to take a look at trends. And a new musical opened on Broadway this week, which gives us a chance to take a look at a current one. The resurgent popularity of early 60s music. Specifically, a sound that bridged the gap between Elvis and the Beatles. A time that was pre-pot, pre-pill, and pre-protest. And perhaps by looking at what made certain music so popular then, we can get a clearer perspective on that era. It was a time of America's last blush of innocence, a time that many people would like to hold on to. It's Saturday night, and the Dean of American DJs, Bruce Morrow, is on the air. Cousin Brucey. Cousin Brucey's been playing 60s music to millions of fans for 20 odd years, and he says the requests keep coming in. The phones are lighting up like crazy already. Let's relive all the happinesses of the years past. Let the music take you back. The year was 1963 when the music was typified by the sounds of the girl groups. These are the Crystals singing one of the most popular songs of the year, Da Do Ron Ron. As we look back at this time, we call it an age of innocence, an era of simple pleasures, and the music reflected the time. The hairdo was the beehive, the dress, the sheath skirt, the dance, the twist. Even in the White House, presidential teenager Lucy Johnson let the good times roll. It was pure Americana. Sensitive and yet very, very, very simplistic. It was simple rock and roll. Before that period, we went to a, the Korea situation. They were selling bomb shelters in Levittown. Uh, how many times did you look up in the sky and uh, we heard Connell rat alerts? We didn't know what was going to happen next. We were getting very tired. We needed a release. The girl groups of the 60s were our safety catch. And they sang to us and they gave us the poetry and the dress of the times, telling us, hey, everything's okay, and they want that again today. People want to remember, want to relive what was happening during those, quote, unquote, happy times. Cousin Brucie may be right. People are not only listening to this music, they are buying it. Many of these early 60s classics can be found in these oldies specialty stores in New York, which enjoy mail orders from across the country. Here, an old 45 can sell for as much as $20. Even mainstream record warehouses sell heavily from their oldies collection. I don't know about your record collection, but I've been playing this ever since the 60s. The 60s rage has audiences packing into live performances as well. A year ago, a review called Leader of the Pack filled the bottom line at Greenwich Village Cabaret. Darlene Love sings Wait Till My Bobby Gets Home, for a hit of 22 years ago. And like so many of the songs, it's a morality lesson. Here, the tempted teen tells the boys who want her that she's waiting for her steady. It's all about yearning. It's about teenage hopefulness and yearning and wanting to be bad and wanting to be good. And the music says it all. tunes in this review. In fact, all the tunes you hear in our story tonight were written by one woman whom you may never have heard of, Ellie Greenwich. 
I was very naive and very innocent. I mean, I'm very much a romantic, and I, I, lo I love things by the book and everything the way I think it's supposed to be. And so that was really me. Ellie grew up in suburban Long Island, just a quick train ride away from the Brill Building, where she and her husband Jeff Barry created their biggest hits with the legendary music producer Phil Spector. Their songs touched a chord with an entire generation. 27 hits in three years sold over 30 million singles. But Ellie told us that not all the songs are as innocent as they may seem. So it was the songs that were written back then, even though we didn't say things like they say them today, a lot was left to the imagination. So you go, and then he kissed me, and you go, mm-hmm, and then what? Well, and when he walked me home, the do run, 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 the do, what does that mean? Whatever you want it to mean. Well, I mean, I think today if I had to write Chapel of Love, I said this to somebody, it's truly called Chapel of Lust. <laughs> songs hooked on to the symbols of the times. Chapel of Love with the Bride in White topped the charts in 1964, touching the sweetest side of the teen psyche. But there was another teenage symbol which tugged just as hard. The guy in the black leather jacket. The symbolic rebel since the wild one when Brando left his tread on teenage hearts. You would always have like the bad guy or the leader of the pack, or the one you shouldn't see, and they always had this great allure, and everybody wanted that man. That's not be married, but that's what you wanted. Here, Annie Golden sings leader of the pack. Another Ellie Greenwich winner in 64, tapping into a steamier side of the teenage psyche. You know, I actually did the stuff you suspected uh, that you only read about in true confession. <laughs> Rock and roll is somehow synonymous with rebellion. Today, to us, it doesn't look very rebellious, but then it certainly was. Back then, as both a teenager and a top recording star, Leslie Gore delivered another Ellie Greenwich teen lament. Maybe I know. We lived our fantasies through this music. Black leather jackets or insane hairdos. That's why I think perhaps we got into rock and roll a little. There was something in us that didn't want to be all that good. Um, but we just didn't know how to get to it. And I think in some way rock and roll helped us maybe get to it. In those days, the road to the charts could begin with the simplest lyric. There she was, just a-walking down the street. Started another number one hit in 1964, Do Wah or circumstance would trigger an idea for a song? Anything anybody says. I, mean, I think about you, you know what I come up with you? <laughs> Seriously, I go, okay. Whenever I wanna hang around I pick up the phone and I call you down and I go down, 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 down we do, we do, down, down down, down, down we do, we do you you can, you can do whatever you want. I make it on the charts, <laughs> yeah. Although Ellie had sung background on her records and had had a brief career as a raindrop, this little review was her first exposure up front. The music weaved around the story of her life. The success of the show set the stage for bigger things to come. I really didn't know this music. I didn't know who Ellie Greenwich was. And the only thing I knew is I walked out of the theater feeling happy. I kind of bounced down the street. And I thought to myself, if I'm bouncing down the street, I bet my audience can bounce down the street, too. Tech, we're talking tonight? Uh, they're starting to work through the light cues. Liz oh McCann God. and her partner, Nell Nugent, are the leaders of a pack of producers banking on the wave of 60s nostalgia to sweep Ellie's music to the mainstream of Broadway. Ken Nugent, can I help you? Their forte has been highbrow hits like Dracula, Mornings at Seven, the stage version of Amadeus, Nicholas Nickleby, and many others. 
But this is their first musical. I saw her walking on down the line, yeah. You know I saw her for the very first time. Rehearsals for the Broadway production began just three months ago. The producers chose Patrick Cassidy to play Ellie's husband and co-writer, Jeff Barry. And as the director, they chose Michael Peters, the much acclaimed choreographer of Michael Jackson's thriller video. I was raised in Brooklyn in a project, and we used to harmonize on the corner, you know, and that's what I wanted to capture in the show, you know, so that it was about the fun and the innocence of that time. Uh, what's fun to me about the lyrics and the music of the 60s is that they were so literal. For instance, in Be My Baby, that particular number is about attitude. I'll make you happy, baby. Just I mean, it's all very literal. It was fun for me to find movement equivalents to correlate with the lyrics. I mean, it's about I adore you till eternity. incorporated the dances of the 60s into the choreography as well. I used the swim that they used to do and uh, the hitchhike, which was a very popular dance at the time. You know, you thumbed a ride. To highlight the same fun and innocence of Peter's choreography, a stack of old 45s was constructed as a background for the songs. And the detailed hem of every skirt and the sprayed perfection of every flip and beehive made a Broadway vision of the 60s come alive. The producers know that the show has a core appeal to the baby boomer generation who grew up on these songs. And their instincts tell them a much larger audience will be drawn to these symbols of good times. We like the idea of the good times rolling. I think that's that the whole interest in this time and place is about feeling good about yourselves. All these kids felt good about themselves. The music that our parents did call noise is now uh, making history it's on a Broadway stage. Well, that means something. That means it's good. That means people like it. And um, I think somehow it gives credence to our teenage years. It was hopeful romanticism and a universal message. Boy meets girl, girl meets boy, they fall in love, unrequited love, they get it together. So I don't care what decade you're in, I think everybody likes that and needs that, and that's a piece of them. People do love the music, and the music to me is the star of the show. Music is the star of the show. The, the uh, show opened this week and got pretty bad reviews, but the music uh, I'll tell you, the, lives. The critics may be overrun on this for two reasons. One is, you remember when the musical Grease opened uh, to terrible reviews? But it was a success because the nostalgia carried it. And I think here, between the vast ticket sales and the fact that the nostalgia is a strange and powerful thing, you know, the, it always seems better to us. I don't remember the 60s being a terrific time. I thought it was a pretty difficult time, but there must have been this pocket. But when you look back, you see, nothing that's 10 years old has nostalgia associated. It's just tiresome and stale. But when it is 20 years old, something comes alive, and you go rummaging around those golden oldie sounds and memories, and they mean something. And I think that's what nostalgia is for us. However, I don't think that that song, Hugh Downs, do 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 whatever, <laughs> I don't expect that it, to be a big it, number. I'm it, sorry. It, I expect it to be on the charts next week. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. We'll be right back.